かわいしてねあアウドビラーメナシェイタンエラインラジームビスミラーヘラハマンエラヒムアルハムドゥレラヘラベラアラミンアラディハダナリハダウマクンナリナハダディアロウラアンハダナラウサラトウサラムアラアシュラフィルアンビアイウォルモサリンタビビーノフューシナウシャフィイドゥノビナウハビビクルビナアビルカシミムハマドアラウマサラーラムハマドウアレムハマドウアラアリヒテイビナタヒリンウアスハビヒルモンタジビンビスミラーヘラハマンエラヒムラビシュラハリーサドリウヤシルリアムリウハルルクダタミリサニヤフカホーポーリアマバーズアサラムウアレイコムジャミアンワラハマトゥラヒウバラカトゥ。All praise belongs to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the most compassionate, the most merciful, master of the day of judgment. Only you do we worship and only you do we seek help from. Guide us onto the straight path, the path of those who you have favored. Not of those who have incurred your wrath, nor of those who have gone astray. Peace, blessings, and the mercy of Allah be upon the blessed Prophet Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet Muhammad is our everything. If he was not a prophet and no prophet was sent after Isa, السلام, then there would be no Imam Ali. Imam Ali is Imam Ali because of the Prophet. The Prophet taught him God's centricity, he gave him the Quran and made him into the spoken Quran. Likewise, there will not be Bibi Fatima. Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. They are what they are because of the Prophet, because Muhammad was a Prophet. Similarly, if Prophet Muhammad was not a Prophet after Isa, we would not have Maulana Rumi and all his mystical poetry. Today, Maulana Rumi is famous in the world amongst non Muslims as well. But he would not exist. He would not be, his works would not be if it was not for the blessed Prophet. One of my teachers yesterday in conversation said to me that if we look at the works of Maulana Rumi, we see that actually they are just the mystical interpretations of the Quran and of. Nahjul Balaga of Imam Ali, Imam Ali's sayings. We will not have the, we will, not, we will not have Hafiz. Hafiz will not exist and all of his poetry. If the Prophet Muhammad was not a prophet, Hafiz and all his poetry will not exist. Ibn Arabi and his philosophical mysticism, all the saints of Islam, Sufism, Irfan, Ibn Sina, Mullah Sadra, and their works, none of these things would exist. Fiqh and Usul would not exist. Maybe that wouldn't be such a bad thing. I'm just joking. Fiqh and Usul would not exist. Taba Tabai and his tafsir would not exist. Islamic art, poetry, music, architecture, none of these things would exist. In fact, We wouldn't have this institute. Al Mahdi Institute exists, and all other institutes and hozas and mosques, they exist because Prophet Muhammad was a prophet. All of this, Ahlul Bayt, Maulana Rumi, Hafiz, Ibn Arabi, all the saints, Sufism, Irfan, Ibn Sina, Mullah Sadra, Islamic philosophy, fiqh, Usulul fiqh, Islamic art, culture, music, architecture, Al Mahdi Institute. 
all of this exists because Muhammad was a prophet. His mere 23 years has caused all of this flowering, all of this flowering and much, much more. You can think on yourselves what there is. After Prophet Muhammad, who is literally our everything, peace, blessings, and the mercy of Allah be upon the blessed Ahlul Bayt, but especially our beloved Imam Hussein. And we will share some reflections on him in the next khutbah, inshallah. In this khutbah, I'm going to say a few things about God's centricity uh, and egocentricity. Now, just because I'm going to speak about God's centricity does not mean that I'm God-centric. Everything that I'm going to say here is taken from the Quran and these spiritual giants, Prophet Muhammad, the Imams, the sages, saints, teachers, past and present. In comparison to them, I am just a fetus or even less than that. The purpose of this life is God-centricity. And this is the predominant usage of the word Islam and Muslim in the Quran. Muslim in the Quran refers to, and Islam refers to, the state of being God-centered. What does that mean, God-centricity? To be directed to God. To be directed to God in body, speech, mind, and the heart. To direct the me, the i the I, my consciousness to God. What does that mean? To be aware of God before, during, and after act the actions of the body, speech, and mind. And this is the meaning of taqwa. And this is what is in the Quran. The Quran says that there are those who remember Allah while sitting, standing, and lying down or lying on their sides. It also says that there are those who whilst they are in the midst of trade, in the midst of trade and business, they are remembering Allah. We also have statements attributed to the Imams, where, for instance, for example, where Imam Ali is said that I have not seen a thing except that before it, behind it, above it, and so on and so forth, is Allah, I have seen Allah. So, God's centricity in its absolute state is to be aware of God before, during, and after the actions of body, speech, and mind. This is the meaning of taqwa. Therefore, egocentricity is to not be directed to God in body, speech, mind, and heart. That is, whenever the me, or the I, or the I-ness, or my consciousness is not directed to God, whenever it forgets God, then automatically it is directed to itself as ego as my desires, my wants, the me. In light of this, it is obvious that to be totally God-centric is difficult and it is a process. It happens gradually. Also, one can never, 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 never claim to be God-centric. I am God-centric or we are God-centric. And this is reiterated in the Quran. In the Quran, the Quran says that Hazrat Ibrahim and the other prophets, they prayed to Allah for God-centricity. They said, oh Allah, make us be Muslim, make us be God-centric, make us be surrendered to you. Hazrat Ibrahim and the other prophets, they were following their own sharias. They were the most ethical of people. They had purified their souls of vices and acquired all virtues. They were consumed with the remembrance of God, and yet, and yet, they prayed to be God-centered. Therefore, just because I'm following a Sharia doesn't mean that I am God-centered. Look at the killers of Imam Hussein or ISIS. ISIS are following some sort of Sharia, humbly, or whatever it is, pre-modern. Or I may be following the Sharia due to, due to my desire for paradise or my fear of hell. Again, the motivation here is paradise or hell or fear of hell. Also, just because I'm ethical, I have some sort of ethical practice, doesn't mean that I'm God-centered. I can be ethical and not be aware of God. 
I may be ethical due to the desire again for paradise or the fear of hell. So, just because I follow the Sharia and I'm moral and ethical doesn't mean that I'm God-centered. However, the opposite is not true. To be God-centered, one must follow or have a Sharia and be ethical. Now by Sharia, what we mean is rules, regulations, laws, norms and practices that are conducive to growth. So today we see many people who don't belong to a formal religion. They are, spiritu they are spiritual but not religious. Even they, when we observe them, when we read about them, when we analyze their lives, we see that they have a Sharia. They have rules, norms, regulations, practices that govern their lives, which are conducive to growth. Now the notion of Sharia is existential, being a student of Sheikh Arif, and I can't resist from promoting that jargon and from speaking it so. But it is true. Even the Sharia, the Sharia, the notion of Sharia, the idea of Sharia itself is existential. What does that mean? All creatures, all creatures, every species of plant, fungus, animals, microorganisms have their own Sharia. Their own Sharia. Their own rules, regulations, laws, norms and practices that are conducive to their growth. Even minerals, atoms, subatomic particles have laws, have their own Sharias. And as you all know, if you take a plant or a creature, and if you put it into a new environment or a different environment, its Sharia, its laws, its rules, its regulations will slightly be modified. And when microevolution occurs, what is microevolution? Microevolution are changes that we observe in the outer features of creatures. When microevolution occurs, again, the Sharia of creatures is modified. And when enough micro evolutionary changes occur, that is when, when creatures gradually become new species, again there is a new modified Sharia. The previous Sharia is still perfect for the previous species, but it is modified for the new species. I've mentioned microevolution. Microevolution is something that we can see in nature, it is observable, we can't really deny it. The problem that we have as Muslims is the theory of macroevolution. Why? Not because macroevolution is wrong per se, it, is, it may not be wrong per se, but the language that is being used, the metaphysics that is assumed, the randomness that is assumed, this is where the problems lie. But microevolution is, is a fact. We observe it in creatures and everything. In any case, this process of modifying Sharia is also true for human beings. As, as humans changed, or their environments changed, or their psychology changed, the Sharias were changed as well. The Sharia of Nu was different to the Sharia of Ibrahim. It was modified and had some new, new, new rules. The Sharia of Ibrahim was different to the Sharia of Musa. The Sharia of Musa was different to the Sharia of Isa and so on. The Sharia of Isa was different to the Sharia of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And Imam Ali modified some of the rulings of Prophet Muhammad. Imam Bakir modified some of the rulings, made additions, made changes to the Sharia of Muhammad. Imam Sadiq as well, he modified certain rulings of the Sharia of Muhammad for that which was in that time. Now even though we have different sharias for all different types of humans, they still have something that is common, essential and timeless. Just like the sharias of different birds, different species of birds, they are all different, specific, perfect for each species. The sharia of the ostrich, its dietary rules, the way it's supposed to grow, how much it's supposed to feed, and the peacock, for example, are different. So, just like the Sharia of different birds, they are all different, specific, perfect for each species, 
and yet there are some essential rules, regulations, norms and practices. Therefore, in all human sharias, in all human sharias, irrespective of whether they are religious or non-religious, there are rules, regulations, norms and practices that are essential and unchangeable and there are those that are variable and changeable and contextual. This dichotomy of essential or the essence of rulings or the essential rulings and changeable aspect of rulings, form and essence, this has been recognized by many, many jurists in their own works, in their detailed works, you will find this discussions there of change, of how much laws can change. Just a few examples. One is Alama Tabatabai. He recognized that there were rules or essential essences that can't change and everything else is up for change. Mirza Naini is another one. Shahidu Sadr is another one. Adla Khomeini in his deliberations on political governance also talks about how things can be changed, laws can be changed, abrogated, even ibadat. And other reformists as well, many of whom we are blessed to have here in the Al-Mahdi Institute. Therefore, regulations of the Sharia, and we mean by this any Sharia, humans or even other creatures, has to undergo change. Therefore, as I repeat this again, therefore, regulations of Sharia, and we mean by Sharia, all Sharias of humans and other creatures, has to undergo change in order to be conducive to growth. In any case, in any case, coming back to our main discussion, God's centricity is to be aware of God before, during, and after the actions of body, speech, and mind. And it is possible, it is possible to follow the Sharia and be ethical, but not be God-centric. Just a final few points before we end this khutbah. There is always a danger, a tendency for us to localize God's centricity, to make God's centricity, to put it into a particular sect. It is marked by the attitude, the characteristic of to be God-centric. When we say to be God-centric, you must be a Shia. To be God-centric, you must be a Sunni. Or to be God-centric, you must be Jewish. It should be clear that God's centricity is beyond religions and sects. It is the only one, it is the only one and it is the one and only religion of Allah. All formal religions and sects and spiritual paths are means to God's centricity. Okay, so all of our sects that we have, all of our paths that we have, all of these different religions that we have, these are just means to God's centricity. When we start to become God-centric, and yours truly is still waiting, honestly, when we start to become God-centric, according to the saints, we realize that religions and sects are just identities, labels, customs, cultures, and ceremonies. They are not real in themselves. What is real is God-centricity. Hence, what gives them, what gives these labels, what gives these identities, what gives these cultures, customs and ceremonies, what gives them all reality, what gives them all value is God-centricity. Finally, one sign of egocentricity is the attitude of I am better or worse than you. Or we are better or worse than you. We are Shia, we follow the fiqh of Imam Ja'far, therefore we are better than the Hanafis or the Hanbalis, or the Christians, or the Jews. This is egocentricity. We have to always remember that according to Quran, it is Allah who gives God's centricity to whomsoever He wants. It is Allah who gives God's centricity to whomsoever He wants. And hence, this is why Hazrat Ibrahim and other prophets, they pray to Allah to give them, to make them be Muslim, to make them be God-centric. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wal Asr Innal insana lafi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bis sabr Allah
اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللہ الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ایون دو وی کین نیور سی آئی ایم گاڈ سینٹڈ او وی آر گاڈ سینٹڈ وی کین سی دس اباؤٹ ادرس لائک دا پروفٹس اینڈ دی امامس اینڈ دا سیجز اینڈ دا سینٹس ون ایگزامپل آف سچ اے پرسن ہو واز ٹوٹلی گاڈ سینٹڈ از آور بلوڈ امام حسین Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. From his own perspective, the perspective of his, son, of his soul, the perspective of his soul, the perspective of its journey and growth to Allah, from his own perspective, he knew, he knew his whole life was choreographed by Allah. He knew this. We've been hearing Shaykh Aris lectures, and Shaykh Aris has been saying about how The Prophet's life, every aspect of it was very, very, in detailed fashion, choreographed. Similarly, Imam Hussein, he knew this. In his soul, he knew this. So, from his own perspective, the perspective of his soul and its journey and growth to Allah, he knew his whole life is choreographed by Allah. He knew that irrespective of what was going to happen to him, regardless of what was going to happen to him, it was necessary for him. It was incumbent upon him to be God-centered, to remain God-centered. And we see that he succeeded to maintain God's centricity in the midst of one tragedy. If one tragedy befalls us, very sort of normal, mundane, minor sort of tragedy we think of, but to maintain God's centricity in the midst of just one tragedy is hard enough. He maintained it and grew in it and grew in God's centricity despite all the tragedies he faced on the day of Ashura and previously. From the perspective of society and religion, we see that Imam Hussein could never agree to Yazid. This is the sort of thing that we are normally told, and of course it is correct on a certain level. But I feel that this sort of explanation is too simplistic. That couldn't have been just the reason. It wasn't just that Yazid was there and he was a bit of a bad ruler, and he was you know, a bit sort of immoral, He was drinking a bit, you know, he was a womanizer, and that's why Imam Hussein. I don't think that's the reason. We find that this is also the case with other Abbasid caliphs as well. For me, I think there must have been an existential threat to the religion of Islam. I think, I suspect, there were plans. There were plans, cultural, political, social, economic strategies that would have been initiated that would have led to the destruction of Islam. There was something at play. Remember, the enemies of Muhammad had now become part of the religion. And they hated Muhammad. And I feel as though they wanted to actually undermine the religion of Islam, to change it. Whether this is conscious or unconscious, I don't know. Thus, I feel that to quash and to quell all such plans and strategies and to literally save the religion of Islam The blood of Hussein was necessary, was absolutely necessary. Now, I don't know if there are researches done on this. I suspect there probably aren't. But I feel the death of Hussein, his family, and the companions of Hussein was a shock to Muslim consciousness. It woke up Muslim consciousness. It forced Muslim consciousness as a whole to introspect. Hence, after Karbala, we find that there are political changes, development in scholarship, a re-looking at what is Islam, what is law, what is fiqh, what is akhlaq. All these things happen after, after that. Finally, the event of Imam Hussein and Karbala shows us that how merely following the Sharia does not entail God-centricity. Ego-centricity was rife amongst those who justified Imam Hussein's killing. They were all following the Sharia outwardly, and yet they were able to justify with Hadith and other arguments the killing of Imam Hussein. All those people, they were following the Sharia, the Sharia, but yet they were susceptible to corruption. They were not able to detect the plots and plans against Islam. They were not able to separate truth from falsehood. The event of Imam Hussein and Karbala shows the difference between God's centricity and merely following religious, cultural status quo blindly. 
We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us onto the straight path. And the straight path is the path of God's centricity. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of our sins, the sins of all who are on this earth, and the sins of all who have moved on to the next world. We pray to Allah to give shifa to all who are in need of shifa, whether they are physically unwell, psychologically, mentally unwell, or spiritually unwell. And I think that includes all of us. Remember, the Quran is a shifa for the mu'mineen, for the believers. So we are all actually unwell, unless we... So, shifa, we, to give, so we pray to Allah to give shifa to all of those who are in need of shifa, and to give sabr to all who are in need of sabr, and to aid, we ask Allah to aid us, humankind, to resolve the conflicts that we are engaged in throughout the world, and for peace to prevail. And especially, I think, times are going to be very tough for all of us now, with the recession coming on and with inflation rates going up. Many, many people, it seems, are going to suffer. So we pray to Allah to alleviate this and to give ease to all people in this country and around the world. Please recite one Surah Fatiha. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Just one final thing, if you want more information on the Sharia, on the nature of Sharia, on God's centricity, then I'll please urge you to read the fourth book of uh, Imam, uh, of, of, he's my Imam, of Sheikh Arif, uh, um, entitled God's Centricity, the fourth book. Um, it has all of this in detail. I'm just copying and pasting what he has, what he has written. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad. لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل وسلم على محمد المصطفى اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آلية المرتضى اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى فاطمة الزهراء اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى الحسن والحسين سيدي شباب أهل الجنة اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أئمة الهدى ودين الحق من ذرية الحسين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد